to be here, but I will remind at the end of the class. So today we're gonna be finishing with this chapter, which is about the Milky Way. Now we are gonna be talking about some properties, it's very generic, uh, discussing some of the parameters, the measuring, the formation of the Milky Way, some of the parts of the Milky Way, like the galactic disk, the bulge, right, the halo. And towards the end, we'll talk about the spiral arms and the galactic center, uh, going into uh, cosmology a little bit. Now, we have one more lab, all right? We have one more lab, and this lab is going to be uh, it's already available, and I want you guys to read it and try and start doing it yourself. And then next class at the end, once we probably finish talking about or discussing the last chapter, we can uh, I can guide you through some of the stuff. It doesn't require Stellarium. It's the only lab this semester that is going to be pure sort of mathematical slash Excelish. In fact, I might be able to go over it because this chapter, as I said, is not gonna be very long. I'm gonna go over the general parameters of the Milky Way, but there is something important I wanna announce. And this is, if you are interested, but you may know people who are interested. So we have decided today to open um, astronomy to be taught on summer too. There is only two science courses, so we're gonna add another one. So I'm gonna be teaching astronomy um, on summer two, that is in July and the first August. So if you're interested or if you know people, uh, class is gonna be hybrid, remote. So lectures are gonna be held like this. However, for that particular class and also for the fall, I'm gonna be in the middle sex now. So, the students are gonna be sort of welcome to come if they feel comfortable coming to class. Uh, labs are gonna be also hybrid, but we're gonna try to make them more in person. Four days a week uh, in the morning, I think at 11, 11, 7. So if, again, if you know people, start letting them know that class should be open tomorrow, all right? Uh, now, some of the labs are the same, some are different, and some of them are gonna be some sort of like physics lab. So I'm gonna be using like lenses and spectrometers over there in the observatory. And the topics are, some of the topics are the same, but we go more into uh, planetary astronomy. So we go into um, formation of the solar system. We talk about the sun, but um, we focus on the Hobbian planets, comets, the terrestrial planets, the Ur cloud, and the Kuiper belt. All right. Um, so I don't know if you guys are looking into some summer courses. That's one that is going to be open. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm guessing chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and even chapter four may be the same. But then this is where we start divert because we're going to planets, the Earth. Mercury, Mars, we talk about all that. We talk about comets, uh, life on Earth, from life in the solar system, okay? Um, so that's it, okay? Um, all right. So now let's go into the second last chapter of this semester, which is talking about what you have in front of you. Now, Obviously, you cannot observe the Milky Way very easily at night. Uh, you may be able to see it in a very, uh, or in a place that it's far from the cities, the countryside, or in the southern middle states in the US, right? Uh, in a very clear night, you may be able to see a gas, a cloud of gas, right? Uh, which has a non-homogeneous uh, brightness and formation, right? That is one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. And from our perspective, 
not every year, but from Earth, actually, uh, normally from the southern hemisphere, we are actually able to see uh, the galactic center, which we know um, correlates with the uh, Sagittarius uh, constellation, the constellation of Sagittarius, right? Um, now, by the way, these slides are very heavy if you want to download them. It's like 300 megabytes. And it's because I combine two set of galaxies, uh, sorry, two set of slides together. All right, and I made a summary of both. So you can see the, um, some details I want to add. For example, here, what does our galaxy look like? And how do the stars orbit in our galaxy? So yeah, it looks like this, right? If you, especially if you look it through a telescope, right? That would be an all sky view. But if you wanna do an illustration, it looks like that. Well, I mean, it's sort of a representation, right? Uh, we see a few stars. We see part of the galactic disk, right? And in some cases, we can see the galactic center. So what we have in there is an illustration and a real image view of the Milky Way. Uh, the main parts are what you see there, the galactic disk, the galactic bulge, the halo, which is not there, but it will be around here, sort of a spherical halo. And then you have the galactic center in there. All right. Now, that distance, I don't believe is correct. Uh, the diameter of the Milky Way is around 30, oh, actually, no, it's around, all right, we have uh, more accurate measurements, but eight kiloparsecs, that's 8,000 parsecs times three, that's 24, it's almost 27,000 light years. No, that makes sense, 27,000 light years. 27 to 30,000 light years, that's the um, accepted value for the distance of the Earth to the galactic center. Is that the diameter of the galactic center of the galaxy is 30 kiloparsecs, so approximately 100,000 light years. So the radius will be 50,000 light years. So we are 30,000 light years away. So that makes sense, right? So we're not that far, but we are on a safe sort of zone on one of the arms. And why do I say safe? Because on the galactic bot, in the galactic bulge, sorry, that's where you have a lot of old stars and massive stars. And we know how, what happens when they do when they die. When massive stars die, they die into a super in a supernova, right? So you can have gamma ray bursts or just a supernova shock wave that could sweep any planets or the possibility of life for any systems that are formed nearby the galactic center. Normally we find young bluish white stars, right? As you can observe in here, um, on the spiral arms. Now what you see there is not really the Milky Way, is the Andromeda galaxy located 2.5 million light years away. It's a much larger galaxy and it's a galaxy that resembles our Milky Way. Right? Is it the closest galaxy to ours? No. We have the large and the small Magellanic clouds, which are irregular type of galaxies. And I'm gonna show that uh, next class. But Andromeda is the closest spiral galaxy to the Milky Way. And it's 2.5 million light years away. So that gives you sort of an idea of astronomical distances, right? Which we're also gonna get now. Uh, these are a lot of pictures. So something about the Milky Way, the Milky Way doesn't look like that or like that. We thought the Milky Way was like a pure spiral galaxy. Now we know by looking at the structure, especially of the uh, arms and the galactic center, right? From different per perspective, that it might be looking more as a spiral barred galaxy. What's the spiral barred galaxy? Mm, yeah, I put a picture already, I think. I'll show you how, kind of like that. So those are spiral galaxies. You see the arms, you see the center very well. Noticeable, kind of bright. And of course we have different types of spiral galaxies. We actually have three types of spiral galaxies. 
some other galaxies that are spiral. We don't notice the arms, but we know they're spiral because of the galactic disk, which is a property of spiral galaxies. Are those the only type of galaxies? No, those are actually the most uncommon ones. We have elliptical, spiral barred, and we have irregular galaxies. Okay. Um, so, oh, there you are. So, in eight kiloparsecs is actually 20,000 light years. So, that works. Um, that's another schematic of the Milky Way, right? Um, you have the bulge. The halo will be all this, by the way. You have the galactic disk, the galactic center. And you have some globular clusters that are held in that position due to gravity, of course. And they have random motions, as I'm going to show you in a bit. The primary features that for sure I'm going to ask on the exam is the disk, the bulge, the halo, and the globular clusters. And of course, I'm missing there the galactic center. All right, those are the main features that you should always remember. And even at this point, probably know as a general culture, general information, right? It's like knowing the planets, right? At least know that our galaxy has the disk, the bulge, and the galactic center. And then you have the halo surrounding it, right? Uh, we are not talking about dark matter yet, but it's coming as well. Um, some of the measurements are important. 100,000 light years is an easy number to memorize. And if you don't want to memorize it in 27,000, I can accept 30,000 light years, the distance from the sun to the galactic center, or eight kiloparsecs, right? So that's another view, if you could see from above the disk, right? And that's what I want to, to get, about. Uh, that's the, the, my point, that the Milky Way, Maybe actually in a spiral bar in galaxy. You see like a bar here in the middle? We have seen galaxies that are like that. And we're actually being pretty nice. That illustration may not even be exactly accurate. We think that the arms of the Milky Way are not very well pronounced. So just like a spiral galaxies, a spiral barret, they have three subclassifications. So we might be in the middle. Spiral barred B type of galaxy, okay? Um, but we know it's most likely a spiral barred, all right? It's like the galactic center kind of being elongated, sort of. Okay, here it is. How do we measure not just the Milky Way, but galactic distances or distances in the universe, which is, by the way, the topic of the last lab? We use radar for the uh, solar system, right? We use parallax for the solar neighborhood. We use spectroscopic parallax. If you remember, I mentioned that on the starlight lab, upper magnitude, absolute magnitude. And we didn't really, well, actually I mentioned a little bit of variable stars and you have encountered them in a stellarium. What is a variable star? A variable star, which allows you to measure distances from 10,000 to 25 million parsecs. It's a way to measure very far distances in the universe. They are normally classified into two, Lyra variable or Cephal variable. And the thing is that the reason we call them variable stars is because their luminosity, their brightness, actually, actually the luminosity, is changing as a function of time, as you see in the graph there. And there is a period for that change. That change causes the absolute magnitude to change with time. And if we combine that with the equation that we use in a spectroscopic parallax, we can find the distance to those stars. And if we find the distance to those stars, we can find a good estimate to the distance to very distant to the, uh, we can find a very good estimate for the distance to very distant galaxies, which is basically the topic of the last lab, measuring galactic distances. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. We are expanding that cosmic distance ladder. The next step will be the Tully Fisher. And the last step is the Hubble constant. It's basically the expansion of the universe itself. Okay, so that's another illustration of the orbit of the stars around the or in the Milky Way. So this in the sorry, it starts in the disk. In the disk here, so here. They just orbit around the center. They don't really have random motions. All right. The bulge stars and the halo stars, they travel in random orientations. That, might, that also includes the globular clusters, all right? Which as you know, are very close uh, set of thousands of stars, right? Um, we know that some of them move as the green arrows are showing you. Right? Just like planets in solar systems, it starts in the disk all orbit in the same direction. With a little up and down due to the, due to the geometry and shape of the arms. What well, we know about the spiral arms, just to give you guys a heads up, is that those are more like density waves. It's like a, we normally study them as a traffic jam, that moving in one direction, but having a jam every so on. And then when the traffic is sort of free, then you have them apart and you have them uh, moving in one direction. But there is always, they're always being squeezed by the density and gravity of the uh, spiral arms, right? So with the stars in the disk, it's very easy to understand. With the bulge and the halo, so the bulge is here in the red, the halo will be the green arrows. They travel in more random more orbits, all right? They are still within the gravitational field of the Milky Way, all right? But because they are more, they are not in the arms per se, uh, their orbits tend to be more up and down, sort of, right? It also has to do with how they were formed. We know the stars in the bulge and in the halo were formed first, and then you had the galactic disk forming, and then flattening by conservation of momentum. And then you have those stars more uh, following a one direction motion. Extra information. So the galactic halo globular clusters are formed very early. Globular clusters are around here, by the way. Those spots that you see there, those are, those are globular clusters. There. And the bulge is here, the halo is here. And it's basically spherical. The stars in the halo are very old. And there is almost no gas and dust. Because it's either being taken by the stars to be formed or being expelled towards the arms, which then is good for us because that's where we have what? Molecular clouds when they cool. And what do we have after that? Star formation, right? So the electric disk is where we have the youngest star and the star formation regions, reflection nebula, emission nebula, molecular clouds, right? And then surrounding the galactic center, you have the galactic bulge. Right? And that's where you have a mix of older and younger stars. Okay. Uh, there is no dust in the halo, but we know there is a lot of dust in the disk and the star formation. Right? So, based on what you know, what would be the best type of wavelength to study the Milky Way or any other spiral galaxy? If we have a lot of dust, we need to find a way to get rid of it, right? When we are imaging. Uh, infrared? Yeah, use the infrared view. And that's one there, right? Because visible light 
is not absorbed, or sorry, it's absorbed, but infrared is not as much, right? So the levels of the levels of extinction are less. There is still some extinction, though. That, uh, trust me, by experience, I know. But you can still correct for it, and you can have a very nice picture, right? Look at the extension of the arms of the disc in there, though. Look at the bulge in there, right? Because the dust is mostly on the disc, right, on the spiral arms. Then it makes sense that we will get more information when we use a infrared image. We can also use X-ray and gamma ray and UV and microwave. Microwave allow us to study the leftover radiation of the, the cosmic microwave bag, which we wanna discuss next time, next class. X-ray and gamma rays, why will they be useful? For which section of the Milky Way? Hmm? Based on what we studied before already. X-ray is uh, used for high energy photons. Right? Normally we have X-ray images of the sun to study the corona and the, st and the solar mass ejections, which are very energetic. X-ray and gamma rays are used, you know why? For, uh, to visualize and to study the galactic center of galaxies, guys. Because what do we find in the galactic center of galaxies? We find in galaxies like the Milky Way, another spiral galaxies, we find a supermassive black hole. And we know black holes emit tons of X-ray radiation due to the creation of gas and matter into the in, um, onto it. Okay, that's another illustration of the uh, orbits, all right? So that's why I said I combined some information here and there, all right? Uh, so we already discussed that. All right, so how do we measure the Milky Way? Um, the first one was done by an astronomer named Herschel, but he didn't took into he didn't take into account the dust, the, the large amount of dust, right, that blocks the view of many stars and star forming regions. So um, also he was not really aware, as it says there, about the galactic center. So he, his uh, measurements were very off, right? As you can see from the picture. But we can actually measure large distances within our own galaxy using variable stars, all right? Now, as I said, there are two types, Lyra and Cephas. And where do we normally find these variable stars? <clears throat> So there is right now uh, the picture of the period, by the way. For variable stars, you have Lyra and you have the Cephite. The ones that we normally use are Cephite variables. And you can tell why we use Cephite variables, right? They are more convenient. The periods are, in fact, that number is not really, well, it's acceptable, but we have discovered Cephite variables with periods of almost a year. So that's awesome because it allows us to have a good window for observations. If you're using iris stars, they are very short, their periods are very tiny. So it will produce a lot of error. So Cephite variables are actually more common to be used. Now, but where do we find these guys? In the instability strip. You didn't find any in the lab I gave you because um, I try not to use, or we normally try not to put those ones in there, but you may have found a couple of stars in that zone. And you may have read in the Stellarium that many of the stars are, are classified as variable stars, but the variability is so tiny that you, they don't really go into the instability strip. In the instability strip, we normally locate Cephi variables, because Cephi variables have very, they have very long periods of variability. 
So the intensity is changing and it's so easy to measure that it allows us to measure, you know what? Let's suppose you have a star in here. We call it the instability strip because the luminosity can change from this to this. Oops. So look how much it can change. A lot, right? Uh, by measuring that, we can actually uh, determine their distances. And the distances normally are, are measured in megaparsecs. So we are already beyond a spectroscopy parallax, right? We are right now in a variable star, variable star uh, measurements. Now, why, are they, why do they vary? Because there is a dynamic balance. We don't really call it imbalance, but the balance that between gravity and pressure, the hydrostatic equilibrium, right? It's not perfect. It's not like the sun, for example. Right? Um, okay. And when you measure the variation of different CFI variables in the instability strip, you get a graph like that. You can actually plot a very nice line across it, across all of them. Um, on the y-axis, you have the luminosity, how they change. Uh, on the x-axis, you have that pulsation period, right? By the way, guys, that's basically what you have to do in the next lab. You have to use CFI variables to determine galactic distances, all right? So I will go over that lab today, most likely. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, so for the light and CFI variables, right? Uh, we can actually know their apparent and absolute magnitudes. And because of the variation, right, we can see the difference and, they, and then allow us to calculate the distance between us and those stars. And because we know, right, that they can be very far from our position, right, we in some cases can use them to estimate not just distances within the Milky Way, but also beyond the Milky Way, right? For example, how do we measure the distance between us and the Andromeda galaxy? By using CFI variables in the Andromeda galaxy, right? Okay, so clusters of light stars can be found where the picture is showing you there, all right? They are not in the plane. And the advantage of that is that if they were in the plane, they will be obscured by the dust and the galactic center. You know, one problem when we look at the galactic center and we, that we face when we study Sagittarius A star, which is the black hole of the galactic center, right? It's not just the dust that is between us and the galactic center, but it's that the galactic center is a very busy environment. It's a very chaotic environment of all stars, supernova remnants, and other theaters, right? So it's very complicated. You actually get obscured by those theaters. But if you look at the light stars in those globular clusters, it's easier for us to measure distances. And that's what we do, right? Uh, so then that's how we get a more accurate view and measuring of the Milky Way. Right? Okay. So based on some measurements, we have determined that the mass within the sun's orbit, so as a sun's orbit, every star in the galactic disk orbits the galactic center. Just the planet orbit the sun, makes sense, right? Uh, but the mass within the solar orbit is 10 times, 10 to a power of 11 times the mass of the sun. The mass of the sun is around two times 10 to the city. So we get two times 10 to the 41 approximately. All right. How do we do? So that tells you, that's telling you the mass distribution of the Milky Way, by the way, within the radius, right? And you can use it to extrapolate, sort of. And you can estimate the mass 
and also sort of like the amount of stars you can actually, because if you know the mass and you know the average mass of main sequence stars, you can actually extrapolate and do a, a calculation, right? Um, but how do we know that? We don't have to use relativity for that, by the way. We can use uh, Newton's laws. The force with a period, we get the velocity. And we know the radius. mv squared divided by r is what we know as a centripetal force. But what's that? That is a gravitational force between the sun and the galactic center. There you are. So you get that equation. That's the equation that we use to determine the mass within the solar neighborhood. It's amazing, right? Yes, with Newton's laws, we can actually find quite some information of the Milky Way or galaxies, right? Now, why do we not, why don't we why don't we need to use uh, relativity? Because we are not in an environment where the speeds are approaching the speed of light. And we are in an environment where you don't have a singularity. Like uh, the sun, for example, the closest star to the sun is 4.3 light years away, right? And the distribution of the stars in the arms is fairly, um, you know, it's not like they are all very far from each other, but they are not close together in such a way that you will have to have uh, to use, you know, general relativity. And you don't also have neutron stars or black holes to worry about, so singularities, right? Very dense objects. So you can use Kepler's law, uh, Kepler slide, and you get a very good estimate. So that's all you have learned right now. What does our galaxy look like? How do we measure it? And uh, how do stars orbit in our galaxy? Do you have any questions? Wow. I told you, right, this, uh, this chapter was gonna be more descriptive. It, it looks long, but it's not really, all right? It's basically bringing together everything that we have studied now. Okay, how is gas recycled in our galaxy? Just remember the star formation, guys. That's how gas is recycled. Star formation and stellar graveyard, because that's what's happening in the arms and also in the center. How do, uh, where do we start then to form in our galaxy in the arms? There you are. So you have hydrogen clouds that cool down into molecular clouds. You have a star formation. You have nuclear fusion in the stars producing elements. Some of them die into supernovas. They expel them back. The gas is expelled back with some elements. Then they return into the Milky Way, right? They get hot, they form atomic hydrogen clouds, but then because they cool down, you have the cycle again. Guys, the cycle of water, basically. Right? So if you know star formation, basically chapter 18 and 17, that's how gas is recycling galaxies. Any questions? No, right? I mean, that makes sense. Conservation of mass and energy as well. Matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed. They are transformed. And that's what's happening. OK? By the way, what is this? You remember? It's a particular nebula. What's the name of it? Uh, no. My tongue. Ah, dang it. It's not pillars of creation. Yeah, the pillars of creation. It's just another perspective, though. You're right. Oh, that pillars of creation? The pillars of creation, yep. Yeah. Hmm. It was in the exam, right? In the quiz. Yeah. I think it was in a couple of notes, too. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just didn't know because, like, I'm seeing that angle. It's like the, the yeah. famous one that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. So high mass stars, they have a strong stellar winds. You know that already. 
and they expel hot bubbles of gas that are recycled as well by our galaxy. Uh, some of those stellar winds, they can trigger star formation, remember? Uh, shock waves like supernova remnants or high stellar winds, massive stellar winds, normally trigger fragmentation in molecular clouds. And that's a list, right? It's a summary of galactic recycling, right? You have new elements by fusion, the stars expel those elements, even low massive stars. What happens before a low mass star dies into a white dwarf? Who remembers that? So what is the process before the red giant becomes a white dwarf? There's a whole process in between. Red giant becomes uh, double shell burning? So. No. Something close to that. The planetary nebula, the envelopes are ejected toward space. And what's left? The very hot core that is non burning now and is slowly cooling by, uh, by being in the very cold environment of the universe. And it's mostly made of electron degenerated matter, right? Governed by degenerated pressure. Ah, right? So that is something that we have done as well, right? So it makes sense that gas cools, as it says on the arrow there, right? All those envelopes that are ejected towards the universe, they cool. And when they cool, you have more molecular clouds being formed, right? From creation, you have, uh, from destruction, you have creation and vice versa, all right? That is a logic in the universe, right? From very chaotic environments, you can have new beginnings. And that's basically the galactic recycling. And that happens in many, in other galaxies as well, not just in ours. So that is another perspective of the Orion Nebula. Can somebody tell me why we have different colors and what are those blue dots in there? And what is those dots in there? So I can give you this picture in the exam and I can ask you to describe all that. Why it looks like that? What is the Orion Nebula? What's happening inside the Orion Nebula? What are these, point, these points in here? What is this, by the way? Hmm? Uh, orange uh, bit there? Huh? The orange bit you were pointing at? Everything. Can you describe all that? What is the Orion Nebula? What's another name of it? It was in a, one of the labs. It was in the star chart. I think so. Star from star chart lab, I think. Yeah. It's a star forming region, guys. It says on the title there, where do stars form? Right? And it's also no, known as an H2 region. It's a region with a highly with abundance of H2 ions. It's ionized hydrogen by the enormous ionization energy, enormous pressure and temperature. Those dots are blue stars. And you know, those are the most common stars forming in the arms. Embedded, you have more stars being formed. The reddish color is due to hydrogen alpha emission. Am I recording this? I forgot. Okay, all right. So that's why it's red. Emission nebulas are characterized by a reddish pink color. Um, okay. Normally the H2 region is around here, surrounded by a, what we know as a photo dissociation region. And all this is the cloud, the star forming cloud. Ionization, right? So normally we have Double ionized elements like hydrogen, but you can also have some small abundances of helium in there. All right. Um, all right. Oh, you can also find oxygen, by the way. All right. What is a reflection nebula? Is what you're seeing there. For example, the cloud surrounding. Uh, the Pleiades. You normally find 
reflection nebulas in star clusters, open clusters. They are called reflection nebulas because they reflect light from stars. Why are they blue? The same reason why the sky is blue, by Riley scattering. The blue wavelengths are better scattered than the red ones, which are normally absorbed. Shorter, um, larger wavelengths are, uh, in this case, better absorbed and actually smaller wavelengths, right? The blue ones are scattered, which is why the sky is also blue uh, here on Earth. So there's another uh, picture there just to show you guys where you can find some of those nebulas, right? The ionization nebulas here no ionization here on the halo. So, because the ionization nebulas, the H2 regions happen to be on the arms, on the disc, that's where you find blue stars and old reddish stars are normally found in the halo where there is no ionization, all right? And that's a summary. Much of the star formation happens in the spiral arms. That is actually called the Whirlpool Galaxy looks very nice. That's an spiral A type of galaxy. Spiral arms, uh, we are not very sure how they are formed. We know why the disk forms. But the arms, it might be due to gravity, it might be due to, it might be due to fluctuations with other objects as the galaxy is being formed. But normally what happens is that it forms those density waves, which are the spiral arms. <clears throat> um, there you are. So to picture those blue stars being formed, you have to picture them as waves being formed surrounding the galactic center or the galactic bulge, right? Uh, those gas clouds that are on the arms, they squeeze together and they start moving into spiral form, spiral fashion, right? As you know, when you start squeezing, you can create environments of high temperature and high pressure. And because you squeeze them together, you may be able to create shock waves of energy. And those shock waves will trigger what? Star formation. And also high ionization, which therefore explains the uh, emission nebulas, H2 regions, like the one shown of uh, Orion. Any questions so far, by the way? No questions? So it all seems to be making sense. I mean, um, we have talked about similar uh, physical or astronomical environments when we talk about the uh, formation of the protostellar disk of a star, right? So that's what you learned. Now you know how gases recycle, mostly from previous chapters, and you know where the stars tend to form in the galaxy. Okay. So now let's talk about the formation of our galaxy, of the Milky Way. For that, I'm gonna use this picture. You probably remember that. What, are that, what does that resemble? Look carefully. Clouds in there. You have rotation, so they combine, they rotate, they flatten, and then you have the galaxy. A very oversimplified picture, by the way. But what does that remind you? Nobody? That resembles star formation, guys, fragmentation. Oh, yeah, I see. Right? Yeah. And then you have the flattening and rotation of the disk. And then you have the formation of the halo, the bulge, and the disk orientation. Yeah. It's a much larger scale, though. That's it. But the physics is the same. The law of physics don't change. It's just that they are now working in a higher scale. That's another picture there of phase one of A, by the way. 
We call it protostellar mass, right? Or protostellar disk. Protogalactic cloud. The space between stars is called interstellar medium. The space between galaxies is called the intergalactic medium, which is more obscure than the, than the interstellar. The interstellar medium is a whole subject by itself. And it's a very hard one, trust me, right? It, it studies everything about the environment surrounding stars, star formation, molecular clouds, nebulas, ionization regions, H2 regions, and all the physics of that. Intergalactic medium is more obscure because there is way more distance between galaxies than between stars. So, I mean, I can talk about a protogalactic cloud and the fragmentation of it, but it's still very hard. And one of the reasons we believe it's also hard is because of the expansion of the universe itself and the presence of dark matter, right? Okay, so uh, look at the halo of the stars in, as a protogalactic cloud starts to collapse. So that is one of the first formations, the bulge and the halo. Makes sense, right? Because of gravity, it comes all together. And then the protogalactic cloud starts to collapse and then it shrinks, and then it flattens. By flattening, it starts to rotate. And it contrasts because of gravity, by the way. And that rotation is due to the conservation of angular momentum, like a dancer bringing its arms close together, or now actually uh, uh, putting her arms away of the body. Right? So the remaining gas starts spinning and forms the disk. And that gas then starts to settle and cools and you have molecular clouds and that's when you start, it start forming region. Any question guys? That explanation is probably gonna be asked in the exam, right? All right, or at least maybe compare how does this resemble the star formation, right? So yeah, it takes billions of years for a star formation. Billions of years later, you have gas or a star gas star cycle, uh, the recycling pro process, right? That we talk about. Again, this model is very simplified. There's way more things happening. Okay, but the general idea is there. And again, we haven't really talked about the black hole at the galactic center and dark matter. We haven't talked about that. And we know those things are real, or at least we know that they are, there is something else out there besides what you see. Everything you're seeing right now is baryonic matter. Four percent of the universe, by the way. Um, so there you are. That's a summary. All right, this is the fun stuff now. So, do you have any questions so far about the halo, the bulge, the, the arms, about the uh, galaxy in general, or is it clear? Or did you guys expect something different from the Milky Way? Who has seen the Milky Way before, by the way? Anybody? Uh, yeah. Have you been in the Milky Way? When, when I was sailing back from California to Hawaii in the middle of the ocean, because there was like no light pollution, you could see everything. Yeah, and you were able to see the arm, right? The mm -hmm. cloud? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's been uh, Arizona is another place where you can actually go and watch it. Yeah, I've seen pictures of, of Arizona where like it's completely dark, so everything's much more visible. Yeah, with like the arm over like all the mesas that's out there. Oh yeah, that's good. You're right. I also like those time lapse things, you know, where it focuses. Yeah, those time lapse videos showing like the arm like passing over the mesas. Right. Just, oh yeah, that's good. All right. Good. So. 
I already gave you a, an idea of this. I kind of show you a video. From 1995 to 2015, but I'm gonna be honest because when we took this video, when we, I used part of the information to submit, uh, to like study the Black Collar Analytics Center, this was what year, 2010. So in 2005, we already had a clear picture that there was something there. But there is uh, obviously always more information. So now they have an 11 year video, there. Uh, sorry, a 20 year video there, right? So what NASA and other observatories around the world, they did, is that we studied the motion of stars around the galactic center. And what we found is highly elliptical motions. On top of that, we found a lot of objects orbiting a seemingly empty space. And that was actually very amazing because we already knew about the concept of a black hole. And we knew that they exist. We have found them before in some other constellations, like for example, in Cygnus X. And by then we already had seen supermassive black holes in Centaurus A, for example. And we already knew about quasars. So, was amazing because this was telling us that just like in other spiral or just like in other galaxies, our own galaxy had its own supermassive black hole, which is probably not as large and as massive as other supermassive black holes that we have observed or studied, like the one uh, on the Event Horizon Telescope, right? That they pictured two years ago. But it's the closest supermassive black hole to the planet. And it's probably one of the, I mean, it should be one of the best environments or laboratories to kind of observe. The problem is that the Galactic Center, as I mentioned before, is very chaotic. So I show you, right? There was one star that was orbiting and then all of a sudden did this. It did like a slingshot. So it went around the black hole really fast. That's because of the enormous gravitational, I don't wanna call it force, because of the enormous, because of the enormous gravitational field. So we know a black hole bends space time. So the curvature of space time is very large in here. So then you see that. So that was one of the evidences. Are there other? Yes. That is basically my project. Another evidence is basically X-ray radiation and submillimeter sub radiation coming from the creation of objects, gas, onto the black hole. Some of the radiation can be observed from our planet and we normally have measurements of consecutive ones. And what we wanna see is fluctuations, variability in that radiation emitted and by Knowing that, we can tell how the accretion is happening and the mass, the structure of the black hole, and basically picture it. And we actually did that. Um, I always forget to um, get that picture, but uh, that would be Sagittarius say star a radio image, because normally you use radio images for it. Oh, there it is. So they actually published this thing. So they've been taking this image. We picture the galactic center, and uh, this was, so, you know, different observatories, they contribute, right? For example, they have this, some of them have this, some of them have this, right? Uh, part of our picture is here, this theater here is the one that we detected. We didn't saw this by that, we didn't see this, but it's there as well, right? The galactic, the black hole is in here. Will you see, there it is. So these theaters, right, are kind of annoying because those are the ones that are obstructing our view of the black hole. The color is just to show you different 
areas surrounding. So the accretion disk will be around there, right? But we don't have a clear picture of the size of the accretion disk. We know sort of how the gas is being sucked in. Look at this other picture that is not that clear, but actually this, this one I like because this shows you already more of the, a better definition of that arm. And there will be the um, a black hole. But the thing is that what we wanna know is how, or if, if there's an accretion disk per se, not every black hole has an accretion disk. Right? Some of them are starting to form one, right? Um, so one of our questions is, is Sagittarius A star an active galactic nuclear? Like for example, uh, this guy. So this one already has radio jets coming. If you compare it with the galactic center, the Milky Way, it's nothing, right? We, have, we haven't even seen a glimpse of a, maybe a jet. Some papers claim that there might be jets already happening in the Sagittarius A star. I didn't see it, right? Uh, at least in the observations that we had, we didn't see evidences for that. The variability was not very large to see that, right? So um, one of the astronomers that was in our group claimed that the observations were not clean properly or that were not being clean enough, right? Um, basically, when I talk about cleaning observations is um, it's like when you take a picture and you want to uh, focus on certain area of the picture. You wanna clear and you wanna focus on those pixels. That is extremely hard to do in astronomy, especially because we don't get visual pictures, right? We get radio images. And those colors that I was showing you are pseudo color. Those are not real colors, right? So there is radio emissions from the center. Visible light doesn't give you anything. Infrared, not really. So radio, X-ray, gamma ray will actually be able to go through the dust, through the chaotic environment and be able, radio emission will be able to do that. X-ray emission will allow you to see radiation, especially if the black hole was active, like Centaurus A. All right, so there it is. So there is evidence of gas going around the center though. So we have found that this arm here, for example, right? Or this, or this, you see those theaters? And the orbit of the stars near the center is probably one of the main evidences that there is a very, that there is a supermassive black hole in that uh, particular area or spot. Uh, well, I mean, um, 4 million times the mass of the sun. In some papers, they claim it's actually 3 million, 2.9, 3 million. Um, 4 million seems to be the most accepted value, right? And we know that by studying the period um, of stars orbiting that particular black hole. Uh, do we have to take into account relativity? A little bit, because that's uh, at least general. You have to take into account to have a better, for the mass, maybe not. But if you wanna go into the creation and the event horizon, you will have to. For example, do you guys know, and this is more planetary astronomy, by the way, that the orbit of Mercury is not, uh, is the, the orbit of Mercury is the most elliptical and the most uh, different from all the orbits of the other planets. The reason is because Mercury, since it's the closest planet to the sun, is having the most amount of effects due to the bend of space time due to the sun. And what we detect is that the perihelion of Mercury, the closest distance, of course, to the sun, it's always shifting. We call that the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. 
You can take a look at it. It's very nice. That's actually another proof that Einstein was right. Because the only way you can predict that from happening, you can predict that will happen is by using general relativity. So here you are, right? So yeah, X-ray flares, they suggest tidal for, okay. So let's talk about black holes again a little bit. So when I talk about spaghettization, right? Basically gas or mass or any object going into a black hole, uh, spaghettization means elongation, spaghetti, right? So when part of your body is already beyond the, galactic, uh, beyond the event horizon or part of the gas, strip of gas, it's gonna be sucked really fast. So it's gonna elongate the gas, right? And now there's gonna be strong tidal forces. Tidal forces are the forces responsible for tides. So in the case of a black hole, matter that is around the uh, creation disk orbiting or around a black hole will be flaring with X-ray radiation due to the high energy part. And this is where um, part of the project also that I did try to explain why do we have why do we have X-ray radiation happening, right? Because what we think is that you have relativistic electrons orbiting in the accretion disk. So very high energy electron. And we think that radio, radio emission that collides with electrons, they absorb the energy of the electron and they skyrocket into X-ray emission. And that's what we observe from our perspective. Um, we infer that from several observations. There are so many papers I had to read for that. And some of them claim that they observe that. Uh, some astronomers are skeptic about that yet. Uh, they need more evidence for that, but there you are. It says, as it says, right, from the suspected black hole at the Milky Way Center. So sometimes you have X-ray flares that we can detect. Um, so there you are. What is the evidence, right? Occasional X flares and the orbit of the stars around the galactic center. Any questions, by the way, about this? Anybody that might be interested on that particular topic? No questions? No, I think we're all good. All right. All right, so here you have another art artistic conception of the galactic structure now. Um, I like this, that's why I put it in here because it gives you the measurements now in kiloparsecs. Uh, we didn't talk about the thickness, but now you know it's uh, approximately four kiloparsecs. Uh, that will be 4,000 parsecs times three, will be 12, around 14,000 light years. Uh, all the stars forming in the galactic disk. You have gas and dust on the arms, the halo. Maybe you can see it now better. You see this halo surrounding it and globular clusters in there embedded. And you have the galactic bulge, more flattened than the halo, of course. So I like this picture. So make sure that you remember it, okay? Or you studied it, okay? All right, let's read this table together. We have the three different theaters or main theaters for the Milky Way. You have the galactic disk, the galactic halo, and the galactic bulge. The main differences, I want you to remember that the disk is flattening. The halo is spherical and the bulge is somewhat flattened. It's still a bit spherical. In the case of the Milky Way, it's elongated, which probably is, or sorry, which explains the fact that it's an spiral barrett type of galaxy. Talk about the Milky Way, right? Uh, the disk is mostly young stars. The halo is all stars. 
The bulge is box. The disc, gas and dust. In the halo, no gas. In the bulge, there is gas and dust, especially in the inner regions. The disc is basically arms. The halo, even though it's spherical, there's no really structure besides globular clusters. And in the galactic bulge, you have mostly a bar because it's elongated and you have those young all stars embedded in there and also gas and dust. And in terms of color, the disc is mostly blue, the halo is mostly red, and the bulge is mostly yellow white. Right? You can see in there. That table there. Hmm? So that's the overall summary of everything we have been talking today. So there you are, guys. That's kind of a better illustration of the Milky Way. Still, the arms look very well defined, so that might not be the case for the Milky Way, but you see that bar on the center, the elongation, right? Uh, now, when we talk about the arms, now we have to talk about how they rotate. It's true that they rotate in one direction, but they cannot rotate at the same speed, right? Uh, this comes into a bit of Kepler loss, but also to the fact that if they did, they will start curling together and you will have no spiral arms at the end, right? So there has to be a difference on the speed of rotation. All right, so that actually that you are seeing there, this one here is getting closer to how the Milky Way might look like actually. Just a couple of arms, very well defined, and the bar at the center, spiral B type B sort of galaxy. All right, now, we're focusing now on the arms. The spiral arms, they are more like density waves, all right? So you have an enormous amount of stars being formed and move in one direction. So you can picture that as this, traffic jam, it's a density wave, right? So even though at some point the cars start to move, like the traffic that you see in the parkway, right? For example, uh, this always persists. And there's always a trigger of these events of high density all over, non-stop. Now, you have young stars, but because the arms are squishing them together, you end up having an expanding shock wave. And then you have the stars being divided, right? But then the arms are, const are constantly moving. So this actually produced the stars to always be in that in and out sort of motion where they get close together and then they are sort of separated, right? That creates a density wave where the density changes with time or location as well, all right? So that is a very simplified picture of the arms, okay? Uh, now you know how it starts in the halo, in the bulge rotate, and also how the arms behave as density wave. Again, it's a simplified picture, but it works at least for the overall picture of the uh, Milky Way, right? All right, uh, let's talk about the mass of the Milky Way a little bit. So now we know that we can find the mass of the inner region, uh, of the region within the sun by using Newton's laws, right? If you know the speed, the radius, we can find that. And we know, it, uh, and we also know that the speed and the mass are related with one another. Perfect. So look. 
Yeah, I know that you want to think that this is like too much, but uh, before I did, uh, before I went into black holes, one uh, small project that we did in our astronomy class was to study the orbital speeds of galaxies, particularly uh, our galaxy and M41, if I remember correctly. But the thing is that according to the models, uh, if you are going to plot the light curve, that's how you call it. You should have something like this. Uh, it goes up, and then eventually, as you go farther from the center, it should be like this. When we, or when astronomers studied the orbital speeds, what they find is that from the galactic center up until, let's say, 10, 20 kiloparsecs, that's all good. And you know what? They start finding this though. So it seems like the orbital speeds are sort of constant. And that threw every astro astronomer, physicist, every scientist out of the picture. I'm talking about right now the 60s, by the way. 60, 70. I mean, our project was to check that. But on the 60s, 70s, they realized this. So there was no other way to explain this by a missing mass. So where is that mass? I mean, we have the disk, the halo, the galactic center, the bulge. We have globular clusters here, but that's, I mean, there's a lot of mass missing here. That is when the concept of dark matter came into a picture. Dark matter states, the theory of dark matter, that there is another halo much larger and much more massive surrounding this halo. It's probably all over like this. That will explain this. Now you're probably thinking, well, isn't that an easy way out? The thing is that we have identified this across every galaxy that we have measured rotational velocities. And when we introduce the concept of dark matter, and then we start going with it, it explains different other instances of what we see in galaxies. But of course, there has to be at least another theory, right? There you are, guys. The speed versus the distance from the center. The red one is what we see. The Keplerian motion is what is pre predicted by Kepler slash Newton. So more than twice the mass of the galaxy will have to be outside the visible part to reproduce the observed cure. What is the other explanation? Okay. So let's talk about our matter. So what we think it could be. So black holes, stellar mass black holes, not really enough for them to be. Brown dwarfs, faint white dwarfs, uh, they believe it used to be, I wouldn't say currently, the best star-like option, but that wouldn't make it for the mass. Here is what we think it is. We are subatomic particles, a very strange, exotic, and a very uh, alternate, I will say, a stage of matter. There are some particles that have been uh, given to dark matter, wind particles and macro particles. But string theorists, if you guys uh, have watched a video from Michio Kaku, um, he will also defend the idea that dark matter may very well be an evidence of supersymmetry. 
Supersymmetry states that every subatomic particle has a super partner symmetrical to it, more energetic, more massive, that we haven't been able to observe in quantum mechanics because we will need very high energies to be observed. Energy is closer to the energy released by the Big Bang. I guess what? We have the Large Hydron Collider and it's been on for at least eight, nine years now. There's no evidence. The biggest discovery of the Large Hydron Collider was the Higgs boson. We haven't found the graviton. We haven't found subatomic uh, supersymmetry. We haven't found evidence for strings. We haven't found yet evidence for, uh, or at least dark matter itself. We haven't. Now, some people claim that we don't have enough energy. That might be true, uh, but so far, there's not really a clear evidence for that, as it says here, no, no direct evidence so far. So obviously, some other astronomers, can, uh, they came with another explanation. Which I, ex which I already told you guys, modify Newton dynamics, which is another easy way out if you ask me, because what they say is that, you know gravity acts as a square inverse law, right? Remember the equation of gravity was gravity equals to the gravitational constant times the mass of the object divided by the distance square, or in this case, the radius square. What they say is that gravity may not act as an inverse square law, but gravity may act as a actually inverse radius law, like that. And yes, there are papers that when you use this, they explain, they have applied this in clusters by the way. And it works. But in other, in other environments, it doesn't. So, in my opinion, it's another easy way out, to be honest. It's just very convenient. Just change the, just change the physics in your convenience, right? Uh, so no, I, we don't think that's the case, but there are uh, evidences for both so far. More for that matter. Um, if we extrapolate and we use the explanation of that matter, we came to the number of approximately 26% of the universe being dark matter. Hmm? Okay, so I already explained this, but the bending of space time can allow you to detect large masses by what we know as gravitational lensing. Right, gravitational lensing is just, use, just using the idea that light gets bent by a gravitational field. And then you can look at the presence of very mass galaxies, stars, or black holes. Right. Um, we talk about that, we talk about this as well, how we picture the galactic center, of course, in radio, X ray, also infrared. And uh, here is another description of the galactic center, right? Uh, because most of the stars and also because of the supermassive black hole, right? And the old stars that are in there, the stellar density is a million times higher, right? Uh, it has a ring of molecular gas of 400 parsecs across. Due to the supernova remnants and the black hole, uh, it has a strong magnetic fields, and it's a strong source of X-ray radiation due to the accretion this surrounding the black hole, right? There it is. So that's another uh, explanation for that. Here it is. That's a more accurate number, actually. 3.7 million times as mass of the sun. Okay. All right. Are there any questions, guys? That's basically what I want you guys to know about the Milky Way.
All right. The structure, the orbit of the stars, how we measure it, the five variables, the galactic center for sure, the black hole at the galactic center, uh, the formation of the Milky Way, and evidences for the black hole at the galactic center, and dark matter as well. So we have already introduced that idea of dark matter. In fact, after that, astronomers were sure about the Big Crunch. The Big Crunch is the opposite event to the Big Bang. We will, uh, it used to be, it was believed that due to gravity and a high amount of mass, now with the dark matter included, the acceleration of the universe was gonna slow down until it stops and then it will all come together into the big crunch. It was not after the 1980s or the late 1980s, early 1990s, 90s, that we were actually surprised to find that the universe is expanding and it's actually accelerating or at least not slowing down. That's because of the other mystery in the universe, which is dark energy, which is seemingly pushing everything away at a faster rate. All right, guys, let's talk about this lab and there's not much time to work on it. So I want you guys to, you don't need a stellarium, but I'm gonna explain how to do this lab, all right? You're gonna measure distances with CFI values. How nice, right? Okay. This is your objective. You are going to fill up this table. So what do we have in there? You are given four galaxies. And for each of these four galaxies, you are given four C5 variables, respectively. And you are given the period of pulsation. So far, so good. You are also, as you know, we can measure the apparent magnitude. And they are very high because they are so far that they are very dim. So they are very high. But what about the absolute magnitude, which we need to find the distance? Well, CFI variables, allow us to study the luminosity of these guys as a function of time. And as you know from the lecture, CFI variables have a very linear formation. So we can linearize their luminosity with their period of pulsation. We can do that. So that's what we get. We can plot the absolute magnitude by the log of the period. Okay, guys. Normally it should be luminosity versus period, right? That was in the slides. Let me show you. Uh, it should be before the, this. If I take the log of luminosity, I get the other axis, which was the absolute magnitude. Then I have to take the log of the period. That's where this log comes from. And that's the magnitude. That's why you have negative numbers here. All right. So why do I need this? Because in the table, you have the period. Well, your first step is going to complete all this column. How? Uh, my suggestion is that you use Excel because you can put all this in Excel and then do this. I wanna do it for a few of those so you can see how, but you can always use a calculator and use a log, right? But if you use Excel, you can put, I'm gonna do it for the first uh, galaxy. So this is the period. Here I need a log of the period. Well, Excel does that for you. 
equals log of this guy. And then you can drag it. And there you are. Let's make this bigger so you can see it. And that's too much. It's there, center, there. So you already feel, well, at least for the first galaxy, you did this. Then you have, for the first Cephi variable, you have the upper magnitude, which is 23.82. So you need that in there. This is 28, so this should be 28. Okay. Now the question, how do you find this guy? Well, 1.767 or 1.77, is a log of the period. And that's what I have here. So what you're gonna do is you are going to estimate where 1.77 is. Which I would say is around here. I wanna draw a line here. Guys, you need to print this, you print it and then you use a ruler. And then that's there, right? That is approximately, look, minus 5.5, minus 6, minus 6.5, minus 6.25. So I go to my table and I put here minus 6.25. Right? Um Okay, so how do I find now the distance? And I need to find this in megaparsecs. So how do I find that? The equation is given in the lab. You wanna use the equation here. 10 to the power of, you remember this, right? We did this in the, I told you, the upper end minus the absolute magnitude is a factor for the distance. But now we're gonna add a five. The five is due to a stellar extinction, due to the dust. So now we can add that factor into the mix. We need that, as you know. And then we're gonna divide by five. By doing that, we are gonna get the exponent. Um, Okay, so let's do that in here. Uh, let me do it by parts first so you can see this. I need to find uh, 10 to the power of parentheses, parentheses, little m minus big M plus five, all divided by five. Ten. So n minus m, right? I'm gonna do it with a calculator and then I'm gonna do it that with Excel. So 23.82 minus minus plus 6.25 plus five divided by five, that's the exponent. So you wanna do 10 to the power of 7.014. How do you do that? You can do that in Google or you can just do it with this. You see uh, this button there? That raises that. So the distance is 10,327,614 parsecs. Hey, I want it in megaparsecs. I divide this by a million. All right, that's my distance. 10.33 megaparsecs, right? And then of course you have to do that for the first four. Once you find the four distances, you want to take the average. The accepted value is eight. You're going to do a percentage error by using the equation here. How would you do it with Excel? Let's suppose that you are comfortable with Excel. Let's erase this. So I will do 10 to the power, parenthesis, parenthesis. I need double parenthesis. 
M equals zero. So M minus this plus five divided by five, and then divided by one million, right? Voila, Excel to the make, right? That's Excel for you. So you can just put a formula there. And then if you have another star, you can just drag it. And it will give it to you. And that's how you guys are gonna, I'm pretty sure, understand more Certified variables, galactic distances, and that will be the last level of the semester, guys. Are there any questions? I'm sure there are questions, guys, so please. Uh, how do we do the, um, what is it, the thing on, if you go down, the thing on the bottom to that, to the right. Oh, this? No, 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 no. on the, um, on the lab. Yeah, you scroll down. Yeah, so how, how did we um, how did we do the average and error percentage, you were saying? The average will be the sum of these four divided by four. Here will be the sum of these four divided by four. You have four different galaxies, huh? Okay. Yeah, and then the error percentage will be... Okay, let's, let's suppose I have this number, right? 10.3. Um, so let's let's find the error between my 10.3 and 8. If you have to do that, you have to do the average. But let's use this and 8. So I will do 10.33 minus 8 divided by the accepted, which is 8 times 100%. So obviously, because it's only one measurement, it's almost 30%. If you take the average of the four, potentially speaking, you should have a lower percentage error. That clear? Yeah, thanks. Wait, do we want the lower percentage average? Sorry, I missed that. Um, I honestly, I think as you go to other, as you go to these ones, it's low. Okay. Uh, for example, maybe for this will be higher, for this will be lower. Okay. All right, uh, there are some questions here. Once you fill out the table, you can answer these two questions here, all right? Um, by when do you think you can do this lab? Be honest, like how hard does it look? If we're allowed to use Excel, it looks very simple. <laughs> you can use Excel. Yeah. I didn't, I, 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 many students say that they don't know how to use Excel, so you can use a calculator. But if you guys use Excel, you can do this lab in like 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a, it's the same as the last lab. It's just a lot of like really simple work. It's just the girth of it. It's just a whole bunch. Where the heck did the file go? Um, I don't know this in um oh wait, I have to look in modules. See modules. I haven't put in the assignments. I wanna <laughs> do it now. Yeah, open that up. I've just uh, downloaded it right out right through right through files. It's in files or it's in uh, modules. Okay, let's make this your Monday nighter. No, but yeah, Monday night. You know why? Because I want to discuss about our money as well. So that should be enough. That's the last lap. Um, okay. Do we have another test before the final? Yeah. Okay. That's on Wednesday, the 5th. Okay. So it'll be a short test, by the way. The final is the one I want to make a bit longer. Now. Um, guys, this video, now you can watch it. This video starts to, uh, uh, talks about a lot of uh, the universe, cosmology. So at some point, it talks about uh, light. It talks about uh, the Big Bang theory. It talks about string theory at the end. Multiverse theory, right? So a student asked me, how many pages? You know what? For this one, you should at least have two pages to three pages. It's a lot of information there. And there are some questions here that I put to enhance discussion. We can talk about this video next class as well. <laughs>
All right. Um, all right, guys, I want to leave it now in there. Um, are there questions about what we talk today or about the lab? Um, I had a question. Um, next Monday, are we just doing, we're doing another chapter? We are finishing with a course next Monday, yes. We're talking about cosmology now. It's going to be short. Okay. And then so we're we gonna have gonna, no quiz. So oh, yeah, yeah. That's our question. I'm going to upload. Um, it's not going to be a homework. I'm going to upload a small web project for the last chapter. So you have like a study guide. How about that? The last web project is going to be a study guide for the last chapters. The Milky Way and this chapter that we're going to talk about cosmology. All right. Um, so that will be dropped for you guys uh, maybe tomorrow or on Friday. And then you will have, hey, remember I'm dropping one of the assignments. So if you have completed every assignment, I mean, take it as an extra credit at this point. All right. Um, but it will be a study guide for the final. And then we can discuss next class. We have a lot of time, right? We can discuss the last chapter, this lab, and this video. Okay, and that will guys that will get you ready for the third test and for the final. Now so, you're probably thinking the final is gonna focus more on these chapters. So the test is chapter 20, 19, 18, and 17, and a little bit of this. Right? Um in fact, I would say probably more. 19, this, this, and this, okay? Maybe not much of 20, because 20 we're gonna be talking about on Monday. So I would say probably 19, 18, 17, and this. That's for test three. The final will include chapter 20. Now, what chapters I'm gonna include the most in the final? 20, 19, the appendix, 18, 17, 16, 15. Yeah, those ones. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and the appendix. That's gonna be the core of the final as you probably were expecting, right? Is that fair? I think so, right? It's actually stars, star birth, star evolution, the day of the stars, space time and gravity, today's chapter and cosmology. That's the core so, of the question. Huh? I have a question. Um, so we don't have any quiz or anything like that that's due next Monday? No, no, only the lab at this point. Okay. And the study guide doesn't need to be submitted? Uh, if you have completed all the assignments, not really, right? I'm dropping the lowest grade. Okay. But we can for extra credit. You can if you want, yes. Okay. And my, the best extra credit that you should do, I think, is the video because that video of Michioka is pretty good, actually. Yeah. I think you guys would like it. Um, unfortunately, guys, because of time, I couldn't do the in-person one, I mean, as I said, right? Uh, if, you guys, if you guys know, or if, you, if yourself, you are interested in some sort of astronomy during the summer, we are opening this astronomy course for summer two, and I will try to make some in-person activities for sure on that, on that one. Anyway, um, that's it, guys. Are there any other questions? Um, just for an idea for the final about how long is it going to be? Um, I haven't really thought about it yet. The test number three is actually short. It's not going to be much. Like maybe just three, four uh, open-ended questions. The final may have at least five. Okay. Yeah. But you guys will have... Monday, the 10th? Huh? That's gonna be on Monday the 10th or is it gonna be on the 12th the last day? No, no, when did we say it has to be the final, remember? When is the last day of classes? It's still 11th. We cannot have it at 12th, it has to be the 10th. Okay. okay. So it's gonna be Monday on the 10th, you said? Yeah, Monday the 10th has to be the final. All right. Okay. Another thing, have you guys done the course evaluation? Uh, no. I did. Okay, please do it because this is the first time 
uh, no, no, actually, the second time that we're having it online, so we want to know your feedback. I've been doing online or remote for a while, but still. By the way, I, I want to ask you before you guys go, based on what you have studied, so now we're going to get into cosmology, right? Which chapter you think was the, less, the least useful for this course? Because I want to actually start cleaning some of this up for next year. So which chapter do you think was the least one that you think that was kind of out of place? I don't know. I would have to look back at everything. Yeah. Was there anything here that you thought was not useful? I think everything was useful, but like some of them like got a little bit off of astronomy itself, but it was only to explain the more complex yeah. in the ahead chapters, like the light uh, chapter that we did. Like it was... It was like a, a bit away from astronomy, but it still helped us like understand everything else from there. Yeah, I thought the light was was important. Some of the ones that had a lot more complex math formulas kind of lot like I kind of got lost in there. Um, okay. Uh, just a quick question: Are we going to have like six to eight thirty to do the final? Yeah, why not? I want to give you like. Plenty of, I'm gonna give you probably more than two, for sure, yeah, why not? Awesome. Because the final is, oh, no, sorry, the final is on the 10th, you have till nine, not three hours for the final. Yeah, I was making so sure I can, was so I can actually make it as long as I want. So that's- Okay, what, cool. Yeah, that's right, yeah, you have the three hours. I just have scroll brain, so sometimes it takes me a while to finish. Yeah, yeah, so you guys will have all the class time to do it, yeah? All right, guys. So I hope that you guys enjoy today's class. We will meet back Monday. Be here on Monday because it's important class, all right? All right. If you, if, you, if you have a question about the lab, please send me an email, all right? Thank you, Professor. Have a great day. Okay. All right, have a great day, guys. Thank you. All right. Have a good weekend. Bye.